Good morning, and thank you to all for joining us for this month's installment of our Environmental Essentials webinar. I'm Ryan Aletto, and along with my colleagues Tim Wilkins and Daniel Pope, we'll be presenting today on the increased trend we've been seeing in our practice in the use of citizen suits to disrupt major infrastructure projects. I'll first provide some background info on citizen suits and potential defenses, then I'll turn it over to Daniel to discuss preliminary injunction hearings. Finally, Tim will be our anchor leg, and with speed reminiscent of Usain Bolt, he'll spend the final few minutes of the presentation covering best practices before and after an incident that could lead to one of these citizen suits. So first, in true lawyer fashion, we have to begin by reading you a few sentences of boilerplate legalese that are admittedly very dry, but also very necessary. So this may be a good time to take a sip of coffee and make sure you're properly caffeinated. Uh, the presentation is provided for informational purposes only and should not be considered specific legal advice on any subject matter. You should contact your attorney to obtain advice with respect to any particular issue or problem. The content of the presentation contains general info and may not reflect current legal developments. And access to the presentation does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and Bracewell. Okay, so citizen suits, what are they? Uh, in general, citizen suits allow citizens or environmental groups to bring actions against a government entity or a regulator who has failed to do so. These suits often take one of two forms. The first is either seeking fines or penalties. The other is seeking injunctions or to stop projects. The second type is the one we're going to spend most of our time on today. Uh, you can see a few federal environmental citizen suit statutes here uh, for the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, RICRA. That's a hard one to remember. These are the ones that we see most often in the context of project opposition citizen suits, so those will be our primary focus here today. The citizen suit provisions in the CWA, CAA, ESA, and RICRA all have a few elements in common. So first, they can all be asserted against a person or a government entity for violation of a standard. Or second, the suit may allege a failure to perform a non-discretionary duty. Generally speaking, a citizen suit plaintiff must wait at least 60 days after giving notice before filing the complaint, but I'll touch on the various exceptions to that rule. So first, for a CWA citizen suit, if it relates to a violation of national standards of performance and toxic pretreatment effluent standards, the suit can be brought right away. For CAA citizen suits, immediate suits can be filed under a few specified conditions, including stationary source violations or violations of SIPs. For the ESA, if the suit allegedly involves a serious risk to fish, wildlife, or plants, the immediate filing is permitted. There's two things to note about RICRA citizen suits. First, there's a 60-day waiting period for garden variety RICRA violations involving a violation of a permit, a standard, a regulation, or a condition. There's a 90-day waiting period for suits involving waste uh, brought against either a past or present generator or transporter of the waste or an owner or operator of a treatment storage or disposal facility or person or entity that contributed to the past or present handling, treatment, or transportation or disposal of a waste that presents an imminent and substantial endangerment to health. There's an exception to both of those waiting periods. A uh, suit may be brought immediately if the alleged violation involves a hazardous waste. Okay, another word on timing. A U.S. Supreme Court case called Hallstrom involved a commercial dairy farm owned by a property owner that was located near a sanitary landfill owned by a county. The property owner alleged the county's operation of the landfill violated RICRA, but the property owner did not allege that such operation involved a hazardous waste. The property owner filed a RICRA suit before notifying authorities, and the county argued that cut was a failure to wait the required 60 days. The Ninth Circuit agreed, and the Supreme Court affirmed. The court said, generally speaking, there is a potential harm to the environment caused by the passage of time and waiting a certain number of days before filing a citizen suit. But the court noted the legislative history indicates an intent to strike a balance between encouraging citizen enforcement and avoiding excessive numbers of citizen suits. The Supreme Court also said, requiring citizens to wait the statutory notice period serves the congressional goal by one, allowing government agencies to enforce their own environmental regulations, and two, giving the alleged violator an opportunity to bring itself into compliance. The Second Circuit in Daig versus City of Burlington distinguished Hallstrom on factual grounds because in Daig, a hazardous discharge was alleged, and for that reason, the Second Circuit allowed the RICRA action to be filed before the notice period expired. Significantly, the court also allowed the plaintiffs to continue with their other claims that did not involve a hazardous waste discharge. Other circuits that have adopted the Second Circuit's holding in Daig include the First Circuit, the Seventh Circuit, the Ninth Circuit, and the Eleventh Circuit. So there are a few general and specific defenses that can be raised against environmental citizen suits 
Uh, we'll start with the general ones, and you've probably seen these in law school or studying for the bar. Things like lack of notice, lack of standing, lack of jurisdiction. If there's a purely past violation, meaning no threat of future harm, that could be a potential defense. If a government entity is diligently prosecuting the case, that's another potential defense. If the alleged harm has been mooted by subsequent activity, that's a potential defense. If the statute of limitations has expired, also a, a potential defense. In terms of specific defenses, under the Clean Water Act, if there is not a violation pertaining to navigable waters, there might not be jurisdiction for that suit. Under the Clean Air Act, a specific defense would be a Title V operating shield. Under the Endangered Species Act, if there isn't proof of a take of an endangered or threatened species, that's a potential defense. Under RCRA, if the risk of harm from the wasted issue is low, that is a potential defense. And the fact that contamination might exceed state regulatory thresholds, but not necessarily federal ones, doesn't mean the contamination qualifies as an imminent or substantial endangerment for RCRA purposes. So we'll briefly touch on here an example of a citizen suit brought merely to impose fines or penalties against a corporate entity, uh, just as a means to contrast those types of citizen suits to the ones that's, that are the focus of this presentation to stop project development. So in 2010, Sierra Club brought a citizen suit against Exxon in the Southern District of Texas for unauthorized emissions that released impermissibly high levels of toxic chemicals at Exxon's Baytown site. District Court judge in that case initially found some CAA violations but imposed no penalties because he believed Exxon had made a, quote, good faith effort to comply. However, on Sierra Club's appeal, the Fifth Circuit vacated and remanded to the District Court, and that same District Court judge then imposed a nearly $20 million fine. At the time, Sierra Club called this decision the largest fine ever levied in an environmental citizen suit. Exxon appealed the fine, arguing that the citizens plaintiffs had not shown adequate standing, but the Fifth Circuit rejected most of those arguments. The case is actually still ongoing, though. The Fifth Circuit remanded to the district court for findings on traceability and Exxon's act of God defense. To contrast the Exxon case to a citizen suit that was brought to stop project development, we're going to talk briefly about the Mariner East Pipeline. So in 2012, Sunoco developed and began to operate the Mariner East Pipeline, which transported NGLs such as ethane, propane, and butane from Ohio, West Virginia, and West Pennsylvania to Eastern Pennsylvania, towards Philadelphia. Sunoco also got approval for its sister pipeline, Mariner East II, which was designed for the same purpose. Sunoco has an easement through Westchester, PA, through which it's been operating both Mariner I and Mariner II. The incident that started opposition efforts against the Mariner pipelines occurred in 2017 during construction activities for Mariner 2 when Sunoco hit an underground fissure, spilled drilling mud over surrounding properties, and caused an underground explosion of drilling fluid. After these events, a citizen plaintiff group called Delaware Riverkeeper Network, DRN, filed suit against Sunoco in June 2018, stating an injunction was necessary to prevent further recurrences of sediment-laden discharges into state waters, which violated the Clean Water Act. The injunction was also intended to stop further construction of Mariner 2. The plaintiffs allege the Delaware River Basin and the river itself would continue to be impacted and that those areas are home to endangered species and migratory birds. DRN alleged its members live and work throughout the watershed, which they claim was adversely affected by Mariner 2, and they contended their members' property interests and economic interests would be, would be adversely and irreparably harmed unless injunctive relief was provided. So bottom line, was the injunction granted or denied? The merits of the injunction request were never actually ruled upon because Sunoco filed a August 2018 motion to dismiss and a September 2019 motion for summary judgment. And in a consolidated opinion in April 2020, the court granted the motion for summary judgment, which effectively ended the case without any real discussion of the injunction request. So we can't say for sure how the injunction would have been resolved, but the fact that the request for injunction relief was not dismissed or denied shows that at least in this instance, the judge was willing to entertain the idea of an injunction being used to stop project development. We note briefly here that there are some state court cases that are still underway. In February 2020, Chester County attempted to enjoin the pipeline. That attempt failed because there was a lack of irreparable harm. In April 2020, Chester County sought another injunction against Sunoco, and to our knowledge, that remains ongoing. We are not discussing the state court proceedings at length because the federal environmental statutes are the focus of this presentation. So now that we've briefly discussed how an injunction can be used to halt project development, I'll turn this over to Daniel, who will talk at greater length about the nuts and bolts of preliminary injunction proceedings. 
Thanks, Ryan, and thank you all for being here with us today. Obviously, each project is different and each citizen suit is different as project specifics shape and limit the kinds of claims that a plaintiff is going to bring over um, or under the kinds of statutes that Ryan just talked about. But one common feature of citizen suits brought against projects is the preliminary injunction. In the context of litigation over a project, the preliminary injunction represents an important inflection point in litigation over your project. It's a short period of high intensity briefing and argument over your project, and it can have a major effect on your project's bottom line, maybe even its viability. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this particular and common phase of a citizen suit against a project and talk a little bit about what you can do about it. Unlike other kinds of citizen suits that seek penalties for non-compliance, the project opposition citizen suit targets your project itself. And a complaint may be followed pretty quickly by a motion for a preliminary injunction. After all, the best thing for the plaintiff and the worst thing for you is that the project is permanently stopped, but a second best option for them and second worst for you is if your project is stopped for several months or a year or even longer. Even if your company is able to successfully appeal a preliminary injunction, the lost time and costs can be pretty painful. Uh, those costs can be attributed to the project delays your project might face. Uh, those costs can come in the form of demobilization or remobilization fees, standby costs. Uh, if you were hoping to build your project in a particular season and take advantage of the natural environment in some way, uh, the seasonality of construction is important. An injunction can really mess with those construction timetables. An injunction can also interfere with your ability to bring service to those customers for whom you've been designing and building this project. And that's not even to address possible PR issues associated with um, lowering confidence in project success. Project proponents and courts may also face some disadvantages in a preliminary injunction fight. Oftentimes, the factual background that's necessary to judges rendering uh, accurate and justifiable decisions is incomplete. And what's more, as every day goes along, particularly if your construction efforts are already underway, that factual background is evolving. There's also a judicial interest in preserving the status quo to render meaningful relief to legitimately aggrieved plaintiffs. So judges may have um, a bias towards enjoining a project when plaintiffs have run into the courthouse identifying um, some pretty dramatic claims about environmental injury. And when they do that, by the way, they may also be bringing sophisticated legal claims that are not fully telegraphed in notices of intent. Ryan talked about notices of intent just a couple of minutes ago. And when somebody brings a citizen suit under a particular statute, they've got to put a company on notice of what the alleged violations are. But there's nothing about state law claims or other claims in, under federal law that plaintiffs may also bring. For example, if the government's a co-defendant, claim may involve an AP, uh, citizen suits may involve APA claims or NEPA claims. Those aren't dependent on notice. They may also file state law claims. Uh, and conveniently for you, TROs and preliminary injunctions may be sought on the eve of major activity, maybe before shovels actually hit the dirt. Don't despair though, I saved the good news for last um, because you and your team have some specific advantages when it comes to defending your project in the context of a preliminary injunction. I want to walk through some of those. The first one that I think about when I think about advantages on the defendant side of, uh, of the case name is the information asymmetry that companies have when they are building infrastructure building facilities and so forth. You and your team know the whole story about your project. And the plaintiffs only know a little bit. What's worse for them is that they may have misrepresented really important facts about your project 
use your better facts to tell your story and give the court the full picture. Things like good citizenship, regulatory diligence, your company's environmental compliance are, you know, I, I put here that it's often overlooked by plaintiffs, but oftentimes the plaintiffs might misrepresent uh, things that you're doing to ensure that you're complying with applicable laws and regulations. Your project may already have its federal, state, or local authorizations partially or wholly in place. And a judge may see such authorizations from other authorities as indicative of compliance with the relevant regulatory process. In a citizen suit, you may have governmental agencies as co-defendants. And in the dirty Western shootout that is the preliminary injunction fight, it's pretty good to have the sheriff on your side. Preliminary injunction also is a demanding legal standard for plaintiffs. Preliminary relief is often considered extraordinary relief, an extraordinary remedy, and it's an element-based test, not a factor test, meaning that a plaintiff needs to satisfy every aspect of the preliminary injunction standard wherever you are to, um, to actually hold up your project uh, over the course of a litigation. And then I think you'll get some legal momentum if you win in the project context Time spent building your project, building your facility is time spent accelerating towards mootness or accelerating towards other relief that doesn't involve serious delays of your project or the possibility that your operations are going to be enjoined for a very long period of time. I want to talk about that legal standard real quick. Uh, the first thing a plaintiff has to show is that they are likely to succeed on the merits of their claims when it's all said and done. So disputes about the likelihood of success on the merits are going to involve the key elements of their substantive claims, right? And they're going to need to show that there's an ongoing violation here under most citizen supervisions. And, and not that we're just looking at a single instance of noncompliance where the regulatory authority should really be the one enforcing the law. Plaintiffs are also going to, need to have to show not just that they're going to be harmed in some capacity, but they're going to be irreparably harmed in the absence of an injunction and that the judge is not going to be able to afford them any relief um, if their activity is not enjoined. Right. So if you can show, for example, that there's another way that plaintiffs can be made whole if at the end of it all um, there's a legal flaw in an authorization that you needed or there's a violation that uh, merits an, in, an injunction or some other kind of relief, uh, that's going to make it more difficult for the judge to decide that there will be irreparable harm absent an injunction. Plaintiffs also need to show that the balance of equities favor them on balance between your company and the plaintiffs uh, who's, who's being treated fairly. And then finally, uh, plaintiff will have to show that public interests are not harmed by an injunction. Uh, I think that's going to be a difficult one for, um, for most companies to win on. The leading case on preliminary injunctions at the Supreme Court level, Winters, um, involved an injunction being overturned because the injunction sought to restrict the U.S. Navy's military training, and that had some national security implications. So not to say that your project wouldn't have national security level implications. It very well might. But um, other than that, public interest is not something we really typically see win out for our companies. I just want to touch on a few preparations uh, that you can make to win or be in the best position to defend against a preliminary injunction. Like I mentioned before, preliminary injunctions can come at you fast. And in the project opposition citizen suit world, there, there are frequently going to be preliminary injunction motions filed. So it really behooves you and your clients to think about how you're going to defend a particular project from a preliminary injunction motion, regardless of how the rest of the litigation plays out. 
I think the first thing that you can do is pay attention to what's happening at the industry and sector level. What types of claims are being advanced? What developments are occurring in case law and so forth? So that you have a good idea of what the front lines are and where, for example, a sophisticated plaintiff's organization might articulate a new legal claim. Second, I think you should involve relevant specialists in project design and routing. A lot of times, um, specialists who are familiar with potential legal issues can spot those well in advance of any litigation. And then also have your litigation team in place uh, if needed, especially when you get that notice of intent to sue. Understand before the lawsuit happens who the best legal and fact advocates are within your project. Who on your project team, for example, can tell the story of how in the scoping and design of your project that environmental laws were followed and observed and so forth. And then when you do get that notice of intent to sue, uh, I like to think about the basic journalism questions, right? Who, who sent it? Are they sophisticated repeat players in this space? Are they a group of citizens who found a, a nearby lawyer? Um, that's helpful information to think about. What kinds of claims are being alleged? When in the timeline of the project did you receive it? Is this uh, an indication that you're going to be facing a, a kind of a well-financed project opposition uh, or not? Where's the suit likely to be filed? Um, think about those kinds of venue questions. And then I also think it's helpful to think about why somebody might be opposing the project. And that helps you think about other kinds of legal claims they might bring. Is this standard nimbyism? Is this an ideological notice of intent to sue, in addition to uh, advocating for somebody's particular claims, uh, or is it something else? And I think you can use that 60-day window to identify and respond to the notice claims. That's really important, by the way, because uh, you may be facing other claims that don't have a notice requirement. And so if you wait that 60 days and think, well, I'll just use the time between the complaints filing and any preliminary injunction motions to deal with those claims. You know, you may be looking at a bunch of other tag along claims uh, with those citizen suit claims. And, and so make use of that 60 day window. And Tim has some other thoughts on how to best prepare for and respond to uh, those notices of intent to sue and the possibility of a citizen suit. Tim. Thanks, Daniel. And, and thanks, Ryan. Um, I, I want to be clear here that, you know, in these project opposition contexts, direct attacks on uh, your permits and on the agencies that issue your permits are going to be more frequent, but we are seeing these citizen suits and the injunctive relief afforded thereunder as a viable tool for opponents that is starting to appear uh, on, on a more frequent basis and something that I think everybody really wants to be aware of when you have one of these opposed projects, you see it in the newspaper, you see it in the activism, you see it in the social media. These are projects that are literally under the microscope that everybody's looking at. And anything that goes wrong is going to be noted. It's going to have uh, a, a reporter show up. It's going to show up in the newspaper. It's going to show up online and it's going to be used against you. Sometimes it's going to be used against you in a citizen suit. I think, as, uh, as, as both Daniel and Ryan discussed, the, the bases for citizen suits are identifying a violation uh, of some statute that your project has committed in the course of construction, whether it's a, a spill or an accident or an incident of some kind, or you've gone someplace you weren't supposed to, or you've impacted a species that wasn't supposed to be there, uh, or you've created an imminent substantial endangerment, a hazard. These are often event or incident driven and project opponents are out there looking for those things that might have happened. There are things you can do up front to help minimize the risk of these things. First of all, take all reasonable steps that you can to minimize risk and to document the efforts that you've taken to minimize risk. Knowing how you're going to respond if there is a release of material, knowing uh, how you know you, you are going to take steps to minimize impacts outside your right of way or off-site 
uh, relative to your project. Those are good things to know. It would be good, I think, to establish clear lines of communication with regulators, officials, and the media so that your message is going to somebody who's going to be able to hear it. And so you're going back to the same folks over and over again, uh, rather than uh, fighting with whatever whack-a-mole might pop up during the course of your project. I think it's really important to identify your compliance obligations up front. Build a checklist of what things you have to do and build, whether that's under your permits, under the regulations, under the statutes, but build that checklist and build around it strong systems and effectively audits or checkups to make sure that you're staying in compliance as you proceed and to track and document that compliance assurance effort is going to really help you defend a citizen suit based on a violation. Finally, it's important to have robust mitigation plans in place for foreseeable concerns. If you know that part of your project is going to involve certain activities that somebody's going to pay attention to, having plans to respond dramatically, quickly, visibly, and strongly, I think is really important. So there are also measures that you're going to want to take in response or uh, in reaction because accidents do happen. When they happen, what do you want to be ready for? First, you want to carefully and honestly document any incident and your diligent response. You want to make sure you know what happened, what went wrong, take photos, take videos, have independent experts validate what happened out there, how things went wrong, uh, and to um, uh, really document how quickly and thoroughly you've responded to the situation. Uh, that helps you beat the irreparable harm argument, which is important uh, for preliminary injunction purposes. You may want to think about doing some pieces of this under privilege, but I really think that it's important because you know that the project opponents are going to take the worst looking photos they can. They're going to exaggerate the situation. I think you want to be ready to go with uh, independent and uh, documented information about what went wrong and what was done to fix it. You're going to want to be able to prove that no violation or hazard is continuing, that it's purely past. Uh, that's a defense uh, under the Walton line of precedent that, uh, that was talked about earlier today. It has to be an ongoing violation or harm to be an actionable citizen suit. If it's purely past, you have a defense. You should also want to show the lessons that you've learned to prevent recurrence because the exception to purely passed as a defense is if something's likely to recur. If you can say this went wrong once and here are the measures that I put in place to prevent it from happening again, it makes any repeat of that a purely speculative exercise and that the courts are not going to enjoy. You should engage with the regulators, public officials, media, and the public. Uh, sometimes engaging with the public is thankless, but it's probably better than not engaging. Um, you should also consider looking into local historical knowledge. Standing for these citizen plaintiffs often requires the use of local landowners. And if a local landowner uh, gets hired in by the Sierra Club to be part of the plaintiff team, and the complaint is you're deforesting, you're taking away these valuable trees, that landowner may have been taking down trees for 50 years. That local knowledge can really help undercut arguments uh, that they are making. And also, as Daniel suggests, use your notice period wisely. If you get this project moving along further, you're that much closer to a mootness defense. So just wrapping it up, project opponents have a large and growing set of tools to fight new development, often going directly after the permits, but we have increasingly seen citizen suits and injunctions using citizen suit authorities as a way they're going on this. Knowing the key issues in what's required to establish a citizen suit, what you can argue to defend a citizen suit, and especially injunctive claims under a citizen suit, that can point you towards preventive measures that you could take up front, as well as responsive measures that you could take after an incident. If you are planning to undertake a project, engage closely with your subject matter experts and legal counsel to think through troubleshoot and plan for this stuff that can go wrong and to maximize your readiness for defending those potential injunction claims. So thank you everyone for taking the time to attend today. Uh, for November, we'll be skipping this Environmental Essentials webinar and we're replacing it with not one, not two, but six Tuesdays of consecutive programming consisting of our Fall 2020 Environmental Seminar. We're going to include sections, uh, sessions on uh, the elections and what they mean for environmental regulation, uh, the future of air regulation, 
Clean Water Act issues, uh, hydrogen and its uh, connection to the energy economy, carbon capture and storage, a variety of great topics with a variety of great speakers. And we look forward to you all joining us for our fall seminar uh, starting in November. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for your time today. We look forward to seeing you soon.